Hi everybody, today we're going to be talking about where sampling data and inferences meet for today's mini lecture. And again, I'm Kristen Hunter Thompson. Reach out with any questions that you might have. So before we begin, let's just do a personal reflection. So you can write this down or you can just pause the video and think about it. Uh, and we're going to use the compass points way of thinking about sampling and inference. And so there are four prompts for you. One, what is your current stance or opinion or feeling on sampling and inference? What excites you about sampling and inferences from data? What are some things that you're worried about when it comes to sampling and inference? And then what else do you need to know or find out about sampling and inference to overcome these worries that you have? So take a moment, pause the video, and either just think to yourself or even write down some answers to these four prompts before moving on. So we want to begin this conversation about sampling, uh, sampling for our data and what inferences we can draw from our data from sort of grounding ourselves in the fact that science is a probabilistic endeavor. So what, it, what does that mean? How do we incorporate that into our approach when working with, with data? Well, if we think probabilistically about knowledge that we have, then more research is always needed and we, we can never prove anything because everything's based on probabilities and whether or not, and I mean that in, a, in the general sense, not in that you're always actually calculating out the probability, but rather that we think of things as things being more or less likely to happen or more or less likely given the certain situations or when comparing these groups, things like that. So more information will always help us feel more confident or our understanding will be more likely to understand what is going on because we can never definitively say yes or no about something when we're collecting data and when we're coming from this, we're using the evidence that we have to make a conclusion. And this is how science works, right? We collect evidence, we use our evidence, we use our best understanding of, those, of, of that evidence that we have, and then we go collect more evidence. And as more evidence comes in, we reassess our understanding ahead of time, and we refine, and we elaborate, and we develop, and we refine our understanding of the phenomenon or the system that we're working with in natural and social sciences. Whereas if we think deterministically, if we think that there's a yes or a no, it's black and white well, about the knowledge that we have, then more research and a lack of proving or proof suggests that something's wrong in what we already know. And this isn't how we go about knowledge generation in the sciences when we're doing evidence-based knowledge generation. And this is an important sort of undertone for thinking about samples and inferences, that we, we come at this from a probabilistic mindset. So let's dive into samples, sample, sampling, all of those things, and, and why we need to remember that we're always looking at samples. So we remember back in a previous mini lecture when we were talking about what are data, um, and Data are things that we use when we're talking about a group and groups vary between different groups. And data is, the data that we have is by far a sample of the whole population. And so the question is, so if, if this big box is the whole population, every single instance in the entire universe of whatever phenomenon or system that we are studying, we never have enough time or resources to collect information on all of it. Instead, we have the time or resources to collect information about some of the whole, and that some of the whole is our sample. And so this, this comes into play in every single time we look at data. So here are three remarkably different data sets, visualizations that we're looking at. The one on the left being a um, a graph from 2016 of, pres of how the presidential candidates were tracking, a graph in the middle being a predictive chart of where Hurricane Sandy might go, and a graph on the right being a um, looking at past data and predicting forward about climate change given or carbon dioxide emissions and degrees Fahrenheit of the atmosphere. 
And we look at graphs like this all the time, but what we sometimes forget is that the data that went into these graphs, every single one of them came from a sample. So for example, with the polling data, every single voting, every single person who's a voting age in the United States was not asked their opinion of to make that graph, but instead a component of the US population. Um, for the hurricane track, like every single hurry, like every single point of where that hurricane had gone and every other hurricane had gone can't be in there. We don't have data on every single hurricane that's ever existed in the world. Um, but we have data from some hurricanes and we use those to include in our visualizations and our models. Similarly for the air temperature. So a sample is what we actually have data from or what we actually have data on because right we can't measure everything but we can look at a representative sample so that's why it's imperative on us to think of what or who is included in that sample what or who is included in the data that we have that we are trying to use to answer our testable question and we need to consider things like is the sample big enough have we taken enough data points from that whole population to really get a sense of what's going on in that whole population. And population here is used in a broad term. It's not just used in terms of number of individual people or individual animals. We often think of population in an animalistic way, but population here is whatever it is that we're studying. And how was that sample selected? How did you choose, or if you didn't collect the data yourself, how did the person who did collect the data determine what got in and what got out? And we're going to talk about that last point in a moment. Um, and just sort of as a reminder, when we're only using a sample to make conclusions and to make claims from our data, it's really important that that sample is representative of that larger population. For example, if we are taking a poll of the American public on how they plan to vote, and we are only asking 18 and 19 year olds and expecting them to be representative of every age of voters in the United States, then that's not probably a representative sample, right? Views and opinions change by age, views and opinions change by location, views and opinions change by prior experience of, and life circumstances. And so that's what we mean by it needs to be representative of that larger population. So there are a few things to consider when collecting your sample and thinking about the data that you have. So either before you collect your own or using data that somebody else has collected, there are various ways that bias can get into our, into our samples. And this first one, selection bias, I've highlighted because it's the fundamental most important one that is really important to think about first. Like, have the samples been randomly selected? It was it, or, was there a reason why some were selected and some were not? And sometimes we can't do random sampling and that is fine, but you need to know why samples were included, why individuals, either if it's people, if it's social science or individual accounts or observations or measurements for the natural sciences, how, that, how those decisions were made as to what was included and recorded and what was not. These are a couple other ways that bias can factor in. Publication bias isn't as much of a deal for us at the moment, but just it's important to be aware of these, especially as we start to use data that other folks have collected. So sampling is important because it's helpful, it's necessary for us to remember that whenever we're looking at data, whenever we're creating our data visualizations, we don't have the whole picture. We are presuming that the data that we have is representative of the whole, which is why it's important to go through those questions to make sure the answer to that is that assumption is yes, that yes, it's okay that we assume that our sample is representative of the whole. But there's another piece of this too, because what our sample is influences what inferences we can make from it for that to that larger population. So we can't just make any claim on the topic, but we but we can make claims from the data that we have. And depending on how representative that sample is, our data is of the whole, then that influences what we can what we can say. So we need to have a sense of what's the time, space, or variables that we actually have data from. And then what can I or can I not say 
based on those times and space variables. So for example, using this data visualization, again on the right of the Hurricane Sandy track from 2012, we can make statements about what may happen about Hurricane Sandy or the track. And we could make statements, we could hypothesize, we could not make a claim, but we could hypothesize where this track might, where a track, if another hurricane with this similar track comes again in the future, what, it, what might happen to it? We can't know definitively, but we could hypothesize. And this space around kind of what we can or cannot include in our claims, we can refer to it as the inference space. The terminology is not so important, but the concept is really critical, that there is a boundary around what we can actually claim from our data. I cannot claim from that map of Hurricane Sandy that I know where every hurricane will go in October in the Atlantic Ocean, but I can make a claim about where we predict, where they, where we were going to predict Hurricane Sandy would have gone based off of those data. And that's, and so that's what I mean by what we can say is dependent upon what data we have. I only had data on Hurricane Sandy, so I can only make a claim about Hurricane Sandy. Let's explore a little bit more. So if we're working with the big broad question of how does weather vary over time in one location, so this being a common kind of conceptual question that we're helping our students understand as they're building an understanding of weather. And let's say we're using this graph. It's of August monthly mean temperatures in Indianapolis, Indiana, and it's data from 2004 to 2018. And so year is along our horizontal x-axis and we've got the average monthly average temperature along our y-axis. And so a student might try to make a claim August temperatures everywhere are, is how they might start their claim. Well, the, the problem is, is that our sample data are only from Indianapolis, Indiana. So we can't actually say anything about other locations from these data. Here's another example. A student may say yearly temperatures in Indianapolis are when answering the broader question. But again, our sample's only from August, so we can't say anything about other months from these data alone. Another example, students might say, August temperatures in Indianapolis are. Okay, great, they've got that it's August, they've got that it's Indianapolis, but here's the challenge. Our data are only from 14 years, from 2004 to 2018. So we can't say anything about any of the other years on the other side definitively, right? Like we can't say that the August temperatures in Indianapolis are definitively this, this that, and the other thing. Here's another one. August temperatures in Indianapolis are X, Y, Z because of climate change. And the challenge with this again, is that our data in, that we have right here in this sample is only from 14 years, from 2004 to 2018. And in order to state things about the climate, we need the consensus is we need 30 plus years of information or data. So while 14 years might seem like eons for our students, it's not actually at a time scale that's relevant. And so in these four examples, we've seen sort of how the time that our data is from, the location that our data is from, and what variables we actually have influences what claims that we can draw from our data. And this is the concept of inference space. And this is how what sample we have influences what claims we can draw from our data. So one final thought is that you can get all of that, you can know what your sample is, you can make sure your claim is like bounded within your, the inference space that you can actually draw from your sample, but you also have to use your common sense. This is just sort of a general reminder, like just because the numbers say so and the numbers indicate or the pattern indicates in a graph, does not mean that it's a claim that we should definitively make about the phenomenon or the system because we need to think about what what is that phenomenon or that system and do these numbers or this pattern make sense to what we know about that system and and that that gut check is really important and there are a wide variety of things a wide variety of graphs and visuals and things that you can look at this is sort of how you can lie with statistics and spurious correlations, you can get numbers to align, but does that actually make sense to what you're doing? So we need to know our sample, 
knowing what our sample is helps us make sure that we're making claims within that inference space from our sample. And then we need to do that common sense gut check of after all of that, does it still make sense? Because we could have a sample that's representative of our population, but if we're looking at the wrong variables, it's not gonna make sense, things like that. If you're really excited to learn more, here are a couple resources that are user friendly and easy to dive in a little bit more to thinking about how we talk about our sample and data and what data are in relation to our inferences that I can recommend. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I hope that this made sense and I look forward to talking to you later. Thank you.